I mean, please feel free, to, feel free to ask questions. Right, so this is the alternate sleeve model, right? You have a, a capacitance branch, and the sodium branch, potassium branch, and the leakage branch. Current is inj injected from outside and uh, so into the inside. So inside is at the VM voltage. Okay, and total current uh, should be equal to, if we apply Kirchhoff's law, IC plus INA plus IK plus IL. And the voltage equation is therefore given by this. So all the four currents, capacitor current, sodium current, potassium current, and leakage current is equal to I, Ix. So generally it's customary to put the voltage term, the derivative term on the left side, and put all the other ionic currents and the external current on the other side. Now the conductances, like I said, are variable. Therefore, GNA is equal to GNA max times this three variable, product of the three, four variables, M cube and H. And uh, similarly, potassium conductance is, uh, is a product of GK max times n to the power of four. Whereas these three variables called the gating variables, there are two variables for sodium and one variable for potassium. Right, and then for sodium again, M is an activation gate and H is an inactivation gate. For uh, potassium, N is all the four, right, are uh, <coughs> activation gates. So you have three equations for each of the three getting variables given by this. So now all that you need is alphas and beta. So the voltage dependence of the conductances, the conductances are now dependent on the getting variables. Getting variables are governed by these differential equations where the rate constants, the rate coefficients are governed by the voltage. So that's how the loop closes. So if you look at all the dependencies of all the variables. So external current uh, controls the voltage, right? And uh, the voltage in turn controls the alpha beta functions, like these are the functions. Uh, and uh, then these functions in turn govern the M, H, and N variables, right? And then the M, H, and N variables then determine the two conductances, G, N, A, G, K which again govern the voltage through the voltage, this equation, right? And that's how the loop closes. So now what we will do, uh, so the main thing, main conceptual difficulty that might arise in the description is that in the first half of the talk, I talked about the channel dynamics, the open closed dynamics of the channel, as if it is governed by just one variable, which is X, by the fraction of open channels, and that is governed by the the one uh, rate equation, first order rate equation. Then in the second half of the talk, I said that if you describe the sodium channel, or potassium channel like this, that won't be able to explain the experimental effects. Therefore, what Hodgson's they have done is they then use a more complicated model of the ion channel, where they assume that each channel is now a more composite structure, where there are multiple gates, right? Some kind of a, gates are, a, conceptual thing. There's nothing like a gate inside a channel. Channel is a real thing, but inside the channel, the gate is a more a conceptual notion, an abstract notion, all right? Just to give more uh, you know, internal dynamics to the channel. So we think of the channel as having multiple gates and think of the channel as being open only when all the gates are open. So now whatever we described before as channel dynamics, we now use it to, to describe gate dynamics. Right, and therefore uh, the previous variable x, which we used to describe the you know, channel dynamics, is now used to describe the gate dynamics. Uh, similarly, like what we have done before. Right, and uh, then the channel open closed dynamics is described as a product of all the uh, gating variables. Right, because the logic here is that only when all the gates are open, the whole channel is open. So that is the logic here. So by that logic, we de we describe separate. Uh, it, it turns out that again, the, all this is hit and trial. It's very empirical. What Hatchling's they have found is that you need uh, something like four variables, four gating variables. You should and imagine that there are four gates within the. They must have tried many combinations. I think it must be a really good for such. But there's no deep logic to all this. I mean, no deep theoretical basis to all this. It must be a very empirical proof for search. So they found that if you do, uh, if you take four variables and assume that the first three are uh, similar and activation gates, and last one is different and which is inactivation gate, right? That is, uh, these gates, first set of gates open when the voltage increases, 
this is the last year it opens when the voltage decreases. I mean, they must have assumed that, right? And then having assumed that, they use exponent data to calculate the coefficients alpha and beta, or calculate their voltage dependency based on the exponential data. So we would imagine that the sodium gate, sodium channel has three gates, activation gates and inactivation gate. And the gating variable for the first three is M. That means the same dynamics is followed for the first three gates. And the for gating variable for the last one is H, right, which is an activation gate. Similarly, for potassium, you have, again, four gates. All four gates are identical, and all are activation gates. OK, and the variable, gating variable here is N. Now the now it's way back to the circuit model, and you see that I've drawn the battery slightly differently, just to show that you know, traditionally in biology textbooks the way they draw is they actually incorporate the sign of the battery in the picture. With whereas I think that's uh, I mean that's not a very elegant way to do it. Don't worry about the sign; always show it in the same direction. But the actual sign you take care of it by using the appropriate numerical value. Right, uh, because what happens is the ENA EK uh, depends on the actual ion concentrations, which are, which actually change. I mean, if you want to make it general, right, you should assume that they can be of any sign, and uh, depending upon the ion concentrations, we'll we'll use appropriate numerical value for ENA EK. Okay, so, so therefore, again, the summary of the equations: uh, this, you have the voltage equation, and then uh, three differential equations for each of the gating variables. And two static equations, which give you the these are the formula for G and GK. So the so basically the original model is made up of four first order differential equations. Only thing is they are all highly nonlinear equations, right? And now what we will do is uh, I'll switch to the code. Right, I have some MATLAB code here. I'll uh, quickly run through the code. So in the beginning, you you because the constants in the code are you know GK max, which is right 0.36 or 36 millisiemens per centimeter square or 0.36 millisiemens per millimeter square. Then uh, you have VK or EK. The notation we're using is here is VK in the code, which is same as EK, minus 77 millivolts, and GNA max is 1.2, right uh, millisiemens per millimeter square. VNA or ENA is 50, right? Uh, then GL is 0 0.003 millisiemens per millimeter square, and VL or EL is minus 54, right? And uh, then CM is 0 0.01, I think it is microfarad per centimeter. I need to look at the exact uh, units of the capacitance. The DT is taken to be 0 0.01 uh, millisecond. Okay, and uh, NITR is 10,000. So now uh, T is taken like this. I, ho I hope you know MATLAB. Then my starting voltage I take to be equal to uh, uh, 64, right? I know, 0.99 I don't know, millivolts. And starting values of the getting variables are like this. Okay, you said define all your arrays and the loop starts. So GNA is GNA max times n cube h, and GK is GK max times n power 4. OK, so now here what we do is this is the key equation. And this is your voltage equation, the numerical integration of the voltage equation. So basically what we do here is, if I go back to the slides, I'll create a new slide. So what we are doing here is, um, if I have an equation like this, x tau x dot is equal to minus x plus x infinity. So this can be written as, so the next, the solution for this can be written, suppose x infinity is a constant. If x infinity is constant, then x of t is equal to, sorry, is equal to, um, if we assume that the initial value of x is, x of 0 is equal to 0, it will be equal to x infinity times 1 minus e power minus dy tau. 
Okay, so this is uh, this thing. So if there is some initial value of x naught, then that will come here, and uh, it will be equal to x naught plus right x infinity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So the same thing is used uh, to do this numeric integration. Only thing is, since x naught is the x infinity is not a constant, we are doing integration one dt at a time. So, so if you go back to this code. So you see that uh, this is the v infinity, right? So you have something like tau into v dot is equal to minus v plus v infinity, right? So we are integrating that only over a duration of dt, very short time duration. And for that we have v infinity plus, uh, so this can v infinity plus v minus v infinity times exponential. So this can be written like this. So in the code, v is equal to v infinity plus v minus v infinity into v power minus uh, dt by tau. So basically, we regroup this a little bit. It will be um, yeah, it's exactly similar to the previous one. What I've said. This is the extra term, right above what we had for initially for v infinity so and we use the same numerical integration method for all the variables because we have four variables voltage um, m n and h all of them use the same approach of uh, numerical integration right and then these are the alpha beta function which i just given right and uh, so if you if you convert your alpha betas into tau and like m, m infinity, h infinity, and all that, you get this. So we have done this uh, very in the very early on in the derivation, the last couple of classes. Tau is one by alpha plus beta, and uh, in infinity value is equal to alpha times uh, tau, alpha m times tau, so tau. Okay, so integration again for m h n is like this. So now let us try to run this. And basically, what we will do, we will give certain input currents and see how the voltage varies. Right? So, I will run the code. It is asking for current value. So, I will start with a low value, some 0 0.01, which is microamps per millimeter square. So, you have three figures coming up. First figure uh, is so the voltage starts from some 64.5 write some value, minus 64 point some value, uh, so my nine or something like that, millivolts. So when I give this current, which is very small, it just shows a small ripple initially and then remains flat at about the same value, it doesn't change much. And obviously you can see that there is no action potential. Then uh, GNA, GK, ideally they should also show a sharp peak and then fall. Right, we have seen that uh, GNA if there's an action potential, GNA rises very fast and falls very fast, and GK rises a bit slowly and falls so slowly. But there's no action potential, so GNA, GK also only show a small ripple and remain flat. Correspondingly, M, H, N, N of variables also show, don't show much variation. They're almost flat. So gradually, let us try to increase the current, 0.02. Right now, let's see the voltage again in the same range, minus 64 millivolts. It's increased slightly, right? Uh, but on the whole, it is still there's no action potential. Well, then let us increase the current a little bit more, 0.03. Ah, so something interesting happened. Suddenly, you have an action potential. The sharp spike, starting from minus uh, 65 or so. It went all the way to close to 40 millivolts. Came back to a value which is less than minus 65, almost like minus 75 or something. So this is your hyper. So this is your depolarization phase, right? And uh, the upward swing, then the repolarization phase, and this is hyperpolarization phase where it goes minus uh, even less than this initial baseline value, the resting potential. The small ripple, and after that settles down quickly. 
uh, at uh, at minus 65 millivolts. Um, the x-axis is in milliseconds. So over 100 milliseconds is what the variation is. So there is action potential, but there's only one action potential. So thing is very quickly, the behavior changed from no IP to a single IP. So let us go back a little and see exactly at what current value does it show the transition. So let us try 0 0.025. Okay, 0 0.025, this value also is an action potential. So then let us try to explore values between 0 0.02 and 0 0.025. So 0 0.021, let us try that. You see that there's no action potential. It's still around minus 65, right, or minus 63 or something. So let us try 0 0.022. Okay, still no action potential. It's increased a little bit, right, but no IP. Let us try 0 0.023. There's an action potential. And so different from the previous waveform, the sharp characteristic spike, right? Okay, then let's explore some value in between. I want to see exactly at what point the change occurs. This is exactly what a bifurcation is, right? A sudden change in behavior as you vary some parameter continuously. So the external current now acts like a parameter. So 0225, right? And already you have a spike. So you see, let me try 0 0.0224 as pi. So let me try 0 0.0223. Yeah. See that at 0 0.0223, there's no spike, right? But uh, moment you change the value at uh, what? Both decimal, 0 0.0224. Suddenly you have a spike. That's the classic behavior of uh, bifurcation. I and mean, this is what you will see, this is the kind of thing you will see in a particularly nonlinear uh, system. Right? This is what is so nice about a neuron model. One little change at a microscopic change in input current, suddenly it shows a very different behavior. This is really beautiful. Okay, so let us keep going. Uh, so mark this value, right? This is the first bifurcation that you see as you increase the input current. Now let us go to 0 0.03, right? And you will see that uh, you have an action potential, single action potential. Let's go further up, 0 0.04. Again, single action potential. And what you see here is when there's an action potential, if you look at the GNA and GK, GNA, as we have discussed before, uh, right? Shows a very sharp spike and rapid fall, just as what we have discussed in the in the class. In the, in the lecture, right? Uh, and the GK varies, also increases, but increases a bit slowly, right? And then falls also a bit slowly. And whatever you expected theoretically, you are seeing it now practically in the simulation. And similarly, M and H, M, H and N also vary. They show a single ripple, and after that, they settle down. So let us increase the current further 0 0.05. Single IP, right? No, not much difference. So, so what we are seeing is for a whole range of current, there is a single same uniform behavior. Suddenly, at some critical value of the current, there is a sharp transition behavior, and after that, the, that behavior remains for a long time, and until the next uh, bifurcation. So, look at look at this. Huh. Something interesting happened when we went from 0 0.05 to 0 0.06. Instead of one action potential, it showed two action potentials. Here also, if you want, you can explore what happens at 0 0.055. Okay, there is just one. There's one action potential. But somewhere between 0 0.055 and 0 0.06, uh, there is a transition. Right, even 0 0.059, there is no change. Um, sorry, 0 0.0595. Oh, no change. Okay, um, 0 0.05955. Okay, so see that even 
0.0595 it shows single ap but you know the change at fifth decimal 1 2 3 4 fifth decimal suddenly it showing a different behavior here again this classic bifurcation so let us go further 0.6 we have seen already right ah uh, no 0.6 suddenly it shows a sharp transition between a finite number of aps to kind of continuous firing aps so thing is you might you might ask a question like you know maybe who knows after 100 it might again become silent so thing is it doesn't uh, just you know uh, take my word for it uh, because uh, we have hit the second bifurcation where after this current the value it will show continuous firing okay and you can go further 0.07 Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I made a mistake. It's not point uh, six. It is. I need to go to point zero six, right? Where it shows still two point six is very high. We'll come to it later. Zero point zero seven. Yeah. So at point zero six, it still shows a finite number of APs. At point zero seven, it shows continuous firing. So let me try point zero six five. Yeah, okay, already shows continuous firing. Maybe zero point zero six three continuous firing. Zero point zero six one. Yeah. So somewhere around there, right? Zero point zero six two. Yeah, four spikes. So somewhere there, it's making the transition, right? From point zero six onwards. Uh, Zero point zero six three. So somewhere there it, may, it switches to continuous firing. So if you go to zero point zero seven again, continuous firing. So you now keep increasing in slightly larger steps. Zero point zero eight. Okay. Zero uh, point zero nine. Okay. Zero uh, point one. So one more thing you can notice here is you can count the number of spikes one two three four five six seven right as you keep increasing your current the number of spikes also increases zero point two one two three four five six seven eight nine you see the number of spikes is increasing that's the frequency of firing is increasing uh, so zero point three we are going in bigger jumps. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So slowly increasing, frequency is increasing. Um, zero point four. Okay, you'll see a slight increase like that. You can measure it if you like. Zero point five. So what you can notice here is earlier uh, we had action potentials, but the peak value was. Slightly higher, up to 20 and 30 millivolts and all that. But as we increase the current, frequency is increasing, but amplitude is also going down. Right? It's still the peak value is still positive, but it is going down. And let us see what happens as we keep increasing the input current. 0.06. Sorry, not 0.6. 0.6. See that uh, the value has come almost come close to zero. It used to go up to even 30, 40 millivolts. Now it's come to zero. Right, and it's it's hardly even depolarizing. So then, zero point seven. Let us see what happens. The peak value has come to even less than zero. It's not depolarizing. Right, polarity is still continuing to be negative, negative, even though it is showing some kind of action potential. Okay, so zero point eight. Right, it's still negative. Uh, so zero point nine. Quite negative, like it's stopping at minus ten or minus fifteen or something like that. So one, okay, um, two. Okay, two is pretty bad. Completely stopped oscillating. Maybe I'll try one point two. You see that it hardly looks like an action potential now. It looks like a triangular wave, 
doesn't have that uh, sharp spiky appearance so you cannot really call it an action potential i'll talk about that in a minute so now it almost looks like a sinusoid so it doesn't look anything like a spike right so right the sinusoid has become quite flat now it's just a ripple like what you started with right um so if you look at this slide uh, this summarizes all that we have seen so as you look at uh, the variation of the output as a function of the external input input current there's a first threshold by where you start seeing a finite number of spikes okay and uh, there's second threshold where you start seeing continuous firing and there is certain spike frequency okay about uh, let's say six spikes in 100 milliseconds that's about 60 hertz right and uh, as you keep increasing the input current the spike frequency also increases slowly right and uh, beyond a point the only problem is the transition here is not a sharp transition right beyond a, th a third threshold current you see that it doesn't really show action potentials but here it's a soft transition right and after that uh, there is no firing so this will be your assignment uh, for i don't know we'll fix a date sandeep how about uh, not the coming monday the, but the monday after is that a good date good deadline so we'll we'll discuss that anyway All right um yeah so we'll send you this code you have to run the code and uh, vary the input current gradually and basically draw this graph okay all all by yourself and only thing is this transition i3 is somewhat uh, hazy somewhat vague so here to define this transition i'll just say you you pick a threshold value right if the peak value of the voltage doesn't go beyond some threshold let us say 5 millivolts plus 5 millivolts then you say it is not an ap okay so then uh, you you find out that this threshold based on that after that there is no frequency at all it should actually be a flat line right so that will be your assignment for uh, we'll decide the deadline now a couple of other observations also you can you can make because we'll make some have similar observations later on when we discuss uh, axonal propagation because we said this presence of this voltage sensitive channels is is absolutely critical to produce action potentials right so presence or absence of voltage sensitive channels that's a that's a it's not a black and white thing it's a it's a gray thing because when do we say there are sodium channels present voltage sensitive sodium channels present when you have 10000 of them 5000 of them 1000 how many right will justify their presence because there can be sodium channels but there can only be one sodium channel that that won't get you action potentials so you can imagine that there should be a critical density of voltage sensitive sodium channels for there to be action potentials right so the normal value is uh, is 1.2 but what if i reduce it so we know right now that for these numbers if i give a input current of 0.07 i get continuous action potentials right but what if i reduce my sodium conductance maximum sodium conductance that means the number of channels present is is less than normal then what happens i get the same current 0.07 You see, there's no action potential. There's only one action potential, All right? Same input current, but number of sodium channels is less than normal, All right? So let me try 1.1. Okay. Same current, 0.07. Right. So again, no APs. 1.15. 0.07. Same current. Right, it's still not the same. So you need a critical number of or critical density of sodium channels, voltage sensitive sodium channels, for you to get action potentials. Um, right. So, so the normal value that we use is one point two, but uh, you need at least one point one seven, one point one six, something like that. to get uh, the continuously firing aps for that current for 
Similarly, let us look at uh, potassium. The normal figure is 0.36, right? Suppose I use 0.2. What happens? I use same current. It is still firing because potassium channels tend to inhibit the neuron, right? We have seen that. So even if I reduce them, it is still firing. But then does it mean that they are useless? I can completely set them to zero. Right, let us see what happens. Um, okay, they're still firing even at uh, point two, I mean, even at point one. So let me try. Uh, let me try point zero five. So I hope you have noticed a difference, right? Uh, the difference lies in the shape of the action potential. Let me introduce a shape in the action, a change of shape in the action potential. So let us go back to this point three, right? Zero point zero seven. You see, the original action potential has this slow rise followed by a sharp increase. And a sharp drop, right? These are the characteristic features of an action potential. But uh, if you decrease the sodium uh, potassium conductance, make it very small, you still have some kind of an oscillation, right? But uh, sorry. But they don't have the same uh, features. You see that that slow increase is gone, and the short is a sharp rise that is gone. And if you decrease it even further, uh, let us see what happens. It's gone. So it is not that you don't need them at all, right? You need them, but uh, the critical value is very low. Zero, let's say four. Okay, so like that, you can play some games with this code, right? Just to get an idea of what is the contribution of various uh, various parameters. Similarly, if you increase capacitance, it will elongate uh, this spike. Because capacitance gives you the time it means the time constant. This time constant is given by tau is given by capacitance by this G tau, right? So if you increase CM, it will elongate your all your events. But anyway, the, the you can vary the conductances a little bit because they, it determine it is determined by the density of the channels, and channel expression can vary from cell to cell, right? And also the conductance also varies based on the dynamics. Etc. Etc. But capacitance you can't vary much because that's a property of the membrane, and generally the lipid bilayer has a pretty standard value of capacitance, right? So you cannot, you don't fool around with capacitance. But other things you can play with, with it, and uh, just you know, just for fun you can vary the other other parameters and see what is the effect on the of the parameter on the action potential. But as far as your assignment is concerned, your job is to reconstruct this graph. We'll send you this code. Right, you have to reconstruct this graph and determine exactly what are these threshold values, I1, I2, and I3. And to de determine I3, you have to choose a certain threshold value of the for the voltage, right? Uh, for you to call that uh, uh, call that voltage fluctuation as spike. Right, what is the threshold value? So you choose your own threshold value and get the plot. And please, if you copy, then the rule is uh, both the source and destination assignments will get zero for right for that assignment. Okay, and uh, I'm just tentatively suggesting that the deadline will be 13th. That is not the coming Monday, but the Monday after. Right. So that's all for today. Any questions? Anybody? Last time somebody had a lot of questions. Are the questions clarified this time? 
Halo. So the no questions then uh, that's all for today let's uh, meet on monday and uh, have a good week